We are on the precipice of dangerous change in Washington, D.C. The city council there is set to go pillow soft on violent crime. Today, council members are voting to crush the mayor's veto on a sweeping package of soft on crime policies. Democrat Mayor Muriel Bowser already vetoed the legislation that was passed unanimously by the council. Now the council wants to force it through. Those things include restoring the right to a jury trial for misdemeanors, making it much easier for criminals to petition an early release, and eliminating all mandatory minimum sentences for every crime except first-degree murder. That could mean lighter penalties for carjacking, which spiked 14% from 2021 to 2022 and has steadily increased for the past five years. Critics doing more than sounding the alarm. If you do the crime, you should be able to do the time. This certainly stretches the criminal justice system, and it makes it very difficult, guys, for police officers to do their job, because by the time they lock some of these people up, they're going to be back out on the street, unfortunately. Well, it's so bad that even the liberal media are raising the alarm. A Washington Post op-ed headline reads, D.C.'s crime bill could make the city more dangerous. They did have to soften it with the word pill. Fox and Friends Weekend co-host Pete Hegseth now. Pete. Hey, Harris. Uh, this, this, is a, this is a George Soros dream. This is a far left-wing DA's dream. Remember, D.C. is 92 percent Democrat. That's how they voted in the presidential mm -hmm. election. So this is how Democrats you, uh, view crime and punishment. And you, you mentioned some of those stats, <clears throat> and they're staggering. But they also, you know what the maximum sentence, the maximum sentence would be for someone who commits a violent crime, a felony, even with a handgun, would be four years. Max four. And they're getting rid of all minimums. This, this is a bill that says, and they, they wrap it all under the familiar phrase, Harris, of equity. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what they miss is that while they're attempting to focus on the fact that most of the criminals who are arrested in Washington, D.C. happen to be black, most of the mm -hmm. victims who are targeted by these criminals happen to be black as well. They're going to they, they're gonna promise utopia and some new, um, you know, anti-racist future, and they will deliver hell to the residents of Washington, D.C. When Mayor Bowser is siding with the police chief and the police union and the Washington Post, yeah. that's an odd alliance of people who at the very least are willing to think sanely about this. This is radicalism on display. This is what the far left wants. And if they get it in two years, D.C. will be a hellscape, even more than it is right now. And part of the radicalism is something that we're seeing, too, with the, with the liberal media. Yeah, they're finally coming out, a New York Post op-ed, blah, blah, blah. Where are those reporters on the streets of some of these cities, particularly in Washington, D.C., talking with the people and, and getting their responses? Their voices have been silenced. We don't even hear about them through the city council vote. Yeah, they have representation. They're 92 percent Democrat, you said. But maybe you got to turn this thing on its head and do something different. We aren't hearing enough from the people. No, we're not. That would require indicting uh, their buddies. Uh, who are running the city council and running the city. And reporters uh, the capital doing city their job. Is supposed to be a, and report, but it's, it's easier to report on painting Black Lives Matter out front of the White House than it is to oh, actually geez. report on the black lives that should matter, uh, who are, who are, whose cars are being carjacked, who are being mugged, who are being murdered, who are being raped. And that beat is a really tragic and difficult one and sure. indicts a lot of the policies that their friends on the Democrat Party support. Wow, eloquently put. Several other cities and states have proposed or passed policies that would soften penalties for criminals. For example, New York State's bail reform law. Philadelphia offers shorter prison sentences and plea deals. And most recently, Illinois and the Safety Act that eliminates cash bail. And Pete, as these things come online, like the Safety Act, which has basically no safety in it, what happens? Uh, what happens is a predictable devolution, they call it progress, but it's actually regressive, uh, into enabling criminals and criminal networks, again, supported by a porous southern border which pumps in more drugs that enriches them even further. Uh, and people start to flaunt it 
in not just big ways, meaning I can assault this person and I know I'll get out because some organization will bail me out and there's no accountability for that, but also the small ways of, I'm going to steal this bag of chips, I'm going to grab this off the counter, I know the guy uh, running the store can't do anything about it, I know the police won't do anything about it, and it all devolves and regresses into uh, uh, chaos. It is chaos for residents. And yet, because these are overwhelmingly Democrat-run cities, they'll never entertain law and order policies. What, what, Leo, what, what was just said, do the, t do the crime, do the time, it's actually very simple. Uh, they just can't do it. Yeah. I, I lived in L.A. after college when it really was a gangster's paradise. And it is hard to see beautiful cities in our nation now bending to the will of these soft on crime policies and those who push it. Yeah. George Soros, number one, as you said. Another chapter from the wild world of woke schooling, <laughs> Northern Illinois University is now offering workshops for faculty and instructors. They claim the goal is to make classrooms more inclusive and emphasize equality. One course advertised as, this session will explore the concept of resistance and the various manifestations of resistance that can arise in classrooms like white guilt, white fragility, and white fr fatigue. Other topics, the decolonization in the classroom, anti-racism, queer and trans inclusion, navigating resistance. I mean, you see there, the list just goes on. Pete. Oh, another day, another uh, syllabus that happened to make its way to the Internet that exposes things they don't want us to know about but are prolific, prolific across higher education. I'd heard of, of white guilt and white fragility. I had, I had to look up white fatigue. Now, I have that today um, as a Minnesota Vikings fan, as Aww. fatigue of the epic failures that they continue to have. But that doesn't really fit their depth. What that is is I'm, I might be accused of being tired of hearing about, um, I, I may be accused of wanting to talk about seeking equality now and seeking tolerance now and the fact that I don't treat people in a racist way and we don't live in a racist society. But I'm unwilling to engage with the historical and the systemic side of it, and therefore I have fatigue. Uh, they're, they're, they always make up new words and new ways to tell kids, impressionable young kids, who have their future in front of them, who have the opportunity to display their merit and achieve in this country like no other place, that either you are oppressed and therefore will face a headwind for the rest of your life that you can't overcome, or you are guilty of the sins of the past. And as a result, you need to bend the knee and, and apologize throughout the course of your entire life. That is poisoning a generation of kids who were poised on the back of Martin Luther King Jr.'s holiday to live in yes. a nation of harmony that, that pushed away that past and rejected it and moved past it. Schools like this are dividing kids and creating future activists um, who, who will perpetuate that cycle. Yeah, and it's really sad because they continue to see themselves as victims who can't help themselves pull up. That's it. Right? That there's no come up for them. And, and there is, don't miss it, a tie between the two, that the soft on crime policies that also give the excuse of, well, this is happening to you. That's why you're committing sure. these crimes. That's why you need the government's help to rescue you with soft on crime policies so you can go do what? Um, Pete, yeah, and the leaders say, they, they say, because you, you've been a victim this long, it's okay if you act out, burn down cities. That becomes the conclusion as well. Pete Hexeth in focus today. Thank you. Always Thank you, good. Harris. Hey, everyone. I'm Emily Campagno. Catch me and my co-hosts Harris Faulkner and Kaylee McEnany on Outnumbered every weekday at 12 p.m. Eastern or set your DVR. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page for daily highlights.